we have to look at, let's look at what we know. What, what does it take for a human being to get as strong as possible, right? They have to have awesome CNS preservation mm -hmm. and they have to be able to recover from work, right? They have to be able to lift heavy absolute loads fairly often to get there, right? So if we're looking at like, you know, I want to get as strong as possible, what I'm doing these three months is going to actually be different than what I'm doing these three months and these three months. So there's no like one principle of like, if you're trying to get stronger, you do this thing forever. It's like, if you're trying to get stronger, you look at why you're not as strong as you want to be. And then you start there. So going back to the point of like the, the bigger, the muscle fiber, the more potential it has to, to be powerful and strong. You look at someone and they're just a small human being and they're like, I want to, I want to bench press 400 pounds. And this person is 150 pounds. Are there 150 pound people that can bench press 400 pounds? Yes. But that's not, that's not, that's not normal. That's like genetics, right? Mm -hmm. So what we would tell that person is, okay, let's put on some size. Okay. So we just said, let's put on size. Now, absolute strength is like something we're thinking about over here. What are we going to focus on? I think it's going to be your next question of like, what are best practices uh, with, with, um, with tempo when we're trying to elicit hypertrophy. Now we're, we're working on hypertrophy with this person with the long-term goal of making them strong, mm -hmm. right? So it just depends on where that person is and what things they need to nudge up to increase their potential to be strong, right? So um, we can go down the rabbit hole as well of like, you know, hormones and, and having the ability to actually get fired up and go. So you can have someone with 90% type type two muscle fibers and they're just so fast twitch and powerful. But if their nervous system is at a point where they're so dampened, where they can't actually turn those fibers on, it's like, how do we do that? You know what I mean? And that's, that's, those are hormones, right? Like that's recovery, that's sleep, that's all of that stuff. So someone could have a, a high potential to be really, really strong. Be because of their lifestyle, they can't actually express it in the gym mm. because they can't actually fire up their system. Have you, have you guys ever went to the gym and you're just like, there's like your power cleaning, great example. And there's like 70% on the bar, 75% and your brain can't connect lifting that. Like you, you, you that for, we talked about it on Sunday, like the first pulls like feels really heavy. It's like your nervous system is not primed to do that for whatever reason. Maybe you slept terribly maybe you're dehydrated, maybe you trained a lot the day before, right? So there's so many factors that go into being able to lift a really heavy load for a rep, right? So and, and to just one more thing on that, have you guys um, ever had a client that maybe is injured and then they come back and they're like, oh, like it, or for some reason they haven't lifted weights and they come back and it just feels so heavy. But, you know, two weeks later, they're like basically back at, you know, mm -hmm. 80%. Yeah, because their nervous system is isn't turned on. Yeah, it's happened to me. I mean, yeah. it's, it's nervous system and it's emotionally right. Like mm -hmm. psychologically, they're not they're not like confident and ready to get there. Um, so sorry to bring this back to tempo. Um, yeah, so if someone's in like an absolute strength phase, right, and they're actually lifting heavy ones, twos, and threes, um, you know, to to lift those things at at their maximal potential, it again depends on. What is, what is my buoyancy out of the bottom of a squat when I go into that squat controlled versus less controlled? So let's say controlled is like a three second eccentric versus less controlled is a one and a half or two second eccentric. Two different human beings are going to want to approach that thing differently. So it's like, what do you respond best to and what can you keep the, the greatest amount of tension and power out of the eccentric in? For some people, that is three seconds down. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I'm one of those people where I lift a lot better and heavier if I control my eccentric. And that's not because that's best practice. That's just what my brain responds well to. Because when we lift heavy weights, the brain is really important. Mm -hmm. Right. Because when we get to a point where we're like, this shit is really heavy and we're at the bottom of a squat, it just takes a it's it's like a very quick decision. It's like, do I want to push this or not? Your brain's like, is this safe? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. for me, my brain responds better to, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to transition. And then I'm out right where someone else is like, they're listening to Metallica. They have headphones on. They're like, 
you know, smelling yeah, salts and they're getting slapped in the back, they might be like, boom, boom, I'm out of here. Right. So it just depends. It's like, where can you have the most amount of control? Is it a two second eccentric or is it a three second eccentric? And I know that seems so minute, but there's a fucking huge difference. One second is a huge difference in an eccentric pattern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. So um, as a coach, I would just look at what do your clients respond best to in eccentrics? What is that tempo that they feel best going into? Ask them, right? It's like, do you feel like, how do you feel when you're, when you're, when you're going down for three or four seconds versus me just telling you, Hey, get to the bottom position, get out of that as quickly as you possibly can. No. Lever lever length. Yeah. A six six person, their tempo is naturally going to be higher than mm-hmm. someone that's five six. Right. So thinking about that as well. Um, and that's important for coaches that coach clients that are, you know, six, four or above. Don't think like, you know, giving someone a three, zero X one tempo is the same exact than a uh, thing as giving someone that's five, six, a three, zero X one tempo. I have to remember that sometimes with Jake and my husband, because he's not got very long legs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's a lot different when you get to, you know, quarter range and half the time to someone that has super long legs, well, then they get to quarter range. Right. So, um, yeah, just considering your client is super important. There's no like this is the this is the tempo for absolute strength. But mm-hmm. you, you do need to think about um, what your client can respond best to and where they feel the most stable and powerful. And I, we keep talking about the squat, but that goes to the bench press, the shoulder press, that goes to everything. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there's, like you said, there's one thing where it's like slap this on absolute strength, but, but just consider where, where can you produce the most power? That's it. It's like, where can you, what tempo does your client need to produce the most power? Use that one. And some, so some key things would be training age, like what's their neuromuscular efficiency. So if they're a beginner, then they would need, you know, m- likely more reps, right? And they would, you know, you wouldn't want to give them 20 reps out of five, five, one, one tempo. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a lot of time under tension, although, mm-hmm. you know, maybe they could handle it, but um, depending on the person. Like, just go push a sled. <laughs> <laughs> don't even squat, go push a sled. I don't, I don't know. Uh, training age is, that's, that's, that's a nuanced one. Because um, when I'm thinking of absolute strength, I'm thinking, um, I want you to do one rep as heavy as you can. Um, so my brain goes more to where can they have, where can we set them up to have the most amount of, of stability through that range of motion without losing strength or without leaking strength. Mm -hmm. Um, because when we like, let's say we said, you know, six, zero X one, one rep max back squat, we're going to leak a lot of strength in that eccentric where by the time we get to that transition phase, we're going to the concentric, they might just be wiped out. Right. Mm-hmm. But so like, what I'm thinking is like, where do we find that happy medium of like, we're not wasting strength, rather we're increasing or we're, we're increasing potentiation to be able to have a lot of power coming out of the concentric. Cause it's, it's like the, the rubber band effect, right? It's like, if we stretch that rubber band long, 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 when I let it go, it slaps together really fast and really hard. But if I stretch it, stretch it, stretch it, and it breaks, right. That's what I'm thinking with like a six zero X one. It's like, that rubber band just broke and they're not going to actually be able to come out of that because they just leaked so much energy. So it's finding that hap- happy medium per client where it's like, where are you the most potentiated coming out of that eccentric? Mm-hmm. And I think that just depends. That depends per person. And a lot of it is based on what their experiences are in heavy one rep max training. Because with me, I'm probably more comfortable in that three second range because that's I just train in that range for so long and I feel really good in that range where someone else that's never even like thought about 
counting their tempo on the way down. If you give them any tempo, they might just shit the bed because they're so focused on counting tempo. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just figuring out what works best for that person, no matter what their training age is or no matter what, um, what training phase they just came out of. It's like, where can you, where can you create the most amount of force? That's, that's, that's the tempo I want to use. That's the time under tension I want to use for this single rep. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, I was thinking more like developing a client to be able to do absolute strength. Oh, got not, it. So like not the, actually not doing the one rep. are in the got absolute it, strength. It. Okay. So clear that up. Got it. Yeah, I would say just spending as much time uh, per repetition in a particular pattern that the client needs until they develop the motor control. Mm -hmm. So let's just change motor control for motor learning, right? It's like we're learning that squat pattern and we're just utilizing longer time under tensions per rep and external loads to really ingrain that in the brain. So the external load is an additional challenge. Mm -hmm. So let's say that this was like a 12 week progression of someone learning how to squat maybe weeks one through two, they're just doing air squats really, really slow, really, really controlled. And they're never really getting to a point where we're like thinking, you know, legs are burning and now we're getting that like strength endurance, uh, muscle endurance conversation. It's like, no, 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 we're just learning here, right? So I want you, it's a skill, right? We're doing air squats, we're stopping before fatigue, we're recovering all the way and then we're doing it again. So let's say we did that for two or three weeks and now we're gonna add a little bit of external load. So let's say we're putting them in the goblet squat. And now it's like, why are we putting external load there? It's to adapt to something new, right? So it's like now our brains are like, okay, I know how to do this squat thing, but I don't know how to do this squat thing when there's this like really heavy, awkward thing in front of me. Mm -hmm. So now I'm like, okay, I have to keep really good position. So my chest has to be fairly high. I have to push that butt back. When I get to the bottom, I have to make sure this thing doesn't do this to me, right? So it's mm -hmm. just like a progressive mechanism. So when do we transition from the goblet squat to something else, right? Like a back squat or a front squat, uh, maybe never for someone because they don't need to back squat or front squat, or maybe because this person wants to one day, like you said, hit a really heavy front squat. It's like, okay, now we're going to introduce the bar. And what is the bar with other load on it? It's just another thing that your body has to adapt to. So through that entire 12 week progression, you're just telling your client, like, I don't ever want you to get so fatigued that you get out of position because we're learning how to move. Like this is a motor learning phase. And anytime we get out of position, we can take away probably 15 reps that we've done good because you just did, you did one bad, right? And your body just learned how to do that one bad motor, mm -hmm. motor pattern. So it's just keeping your clients um, very submaximal in load, having them go through the ranges of motion really, really slow because if I go through a six second eccentric versus a one second eccentric, I just did one rep, but maybe I just ingrained 10 in there because now my body's learning how to stay in this great position as my muscles elongate. And then now I have to transition and my muscles are, are going back together in concentrics and I'm still learning how to do it. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, sorry, that was a super long, long thought of that. Th that's how I think we need to approach motor control or motor learning is not wiping people out and thinking like we need muscle endurance we have to make this burn it's like it's like no no no. your client is literally just learning you'll get to that point where where it's like maybe you're starting to think about muscle endurance maybe you're starting to think about strength endurance all of those things but you're not there yet if you're in the motor control motor pattern motor motor learning piece of of this whole puzzle and the and the whole thing is like why do we think we need to make it burn for a new person as coaches like where did that come from because I mean, yeah, there's there's obviously like the metabolic effect um, that you get from training, but does it have to be from like, what is the intention? The intention is to develop this pattern. You can get that elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, but I would say that there are some really good benefits of like some instability happening mm -hmm. uh, while your client like learns to fix things. Right. So think about like someone that you're having do like this really heavy goblet squat and they're going down and they're shaking 
it's like that's actually a really good sign because they're like they're navigating and they're learning how to like Mm -hmm. pattern this thing so when you start to see like shaking occurring that's literally learning happening right there in their brain yeah yeah they're like yeah (laughs) (laughs) they're like how do i navigate this this pattern of movement and then they do it and then the most beautiful thing is when you start to see your client get out of position and you don't say anything to them and they just fix it Mm -hmm. that's motor learning right they feel something off and they fix that thing right there in the spot it's like just give yourself a gold star or give your client a gold star because they're learning right there on the spot. You just saw it happen. So those are really cool things to look at. But what we don't want to happen is our client getting out of position and then just like grinding through reps out of position. It's like we need them to learn when when wrong is occurring. And when we're going slower through eccentrics and concentrics, it just it's a great opportunity to learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. 